Alright, I'm not going to be near as polished as Dave is, but um, I'm Landon Blakey, a farm down by Latimer, Iowa. It's about 60 miles south of here, so I'm pretty much in you guys' area. Our soil is about the same as yours, grain issues, same as yours, but we started doing cover crops about seven years ago, and we're gradually working up on it. We've got about 4,000 acres up in this year, so we're getting more all the time, but this is a picture of a field that was beans. Um, we aerial seeded oats and radishes into it, about two bushel of oats and six pounds of radish into it on the 14th of September. And then that's what it looked like about a week ago when I took these pictures. Um, this year, I'm going to jump around because I'm not a formal thing, but this year we, our beans didn't dry down in the field like they normally do, so we had to delay harvest of them. And the oats in the field got fairly tall. They got up to be about eight inches tall when we combined the beans. And we did have a few issues with the plug and the grapefruit belts on our combines. And but we fought through it and it worked. But you really don't want it to be an inch tall in the combine, you know. But as you can see, it kind of it recovered from it. You can kind of see where our combine drove, but other than that looks pretty good. This is just another picture of the same field, a little bit closer. Um, last couple of years I've been doing like a bushel and a quarter of oats, bushel and a half. This year I'm trying two on some of it, just to try to get a thicker stand. You can see there's still ground area, but hell in a week that'd be dead, so. Um, this is the same field. I have the water bottle in there just for a point of reference so you can kind of tell how tall they are. Kind of helps to see what it actually height. And those are some radishes I pulled up in that same field. Um, so they were seeded the 14th of September with an airplane and then this was about a week ago. Um, this is another, kind of show you a little bit of the issue. Um, you guys had the same rainstorm we did in late September. It grounded out any pond area that set water. My cover crop grounded out. That's just a picture of the pond in one of the fields. This shows you it will die if it finally floods. Um, this is a picture on corn stubble. This would have been seeded the 25th of August with an airplane. Um, it's 70 pounds of cereal rye and about six, seven pounds of radish. Um, that's just a picture of looking down at it. There's looking down the row, same field, same spot basically. There's the water bottle in the field, same reference. I was driving out of the gator doing tissue samples. So. Um, I scraped the stubble where the trash away so you can kind of see what it looked like. It really has a pretty nice stand. This was on like 108. 10 day corn, um, and we didn't combine it until probably three weeks ago. Here's a picture of the dirt in that same spot where it scraped the trash away. This field has had covers for four years. You can see the wormholes in it. It's just a random spot in the field. There's the, what the surface of the dirt was. You can see where the worms were going in and some middlings there. Same plot of dirt. <laughs> um, this field, um, we've got hogs, so we inject hog manure on pretty much all of our stuff going to corn. Um, this field had hog manure injected on it on October, um, would have been about October 15th. And it was seeded early with the airplane on 14th of September. But we have low disturbance injectors on the manure tanks. And you can kind of see where the tank tracks were, but it really didn't seem to hurt the cover too bad with the low disturbance injectors. There's a picture in the same field. Um, there's the manure tank track. You can kind of see where we went along. Um, all right, this field um, it was aerial seeded airplane on the 14th of September into the corn stalks, and it would have been rye and radishes. It was just seeded three weeks after my initial seeding. Um, I did an experiment this year. I hired a guy with a Aggie, similar to his system, to go over the top and blow it in, but between the guy doing it, not wanting to work weekends, and then it rained a shit ton in August, he didn't get it done. And so I had to seed the rye and radishes when I seeded my stuff on the soybeans. As you can see, it didn't grow very well, as well. There's a picture looking down at it. There's a picture of soil surface. I think the rye will come next spring. It's just a lot smaller now. Um, this spot, there was a, Spot one of the fields, there's more of them, but that's where I had a planter skip where I 
for some reason I raised the planter up and went over and that was just what it looks like where there was no corn. So you can see how thick it actually would be if you didn't see the corn stalks in it. Um, this is a different field, aerial seeded, same way, 25th of August. Um, but this field was 99 day corn and I combined it probably the 20th of September. So you can see it has a whole lot more growth. It's pretty thick out there actually. Um, there's a radish from that field. The radish is bigger, just had more sunlight I think earlier on. So. Um, our tillage practice, we used to rip everything and then field cultivate in the spring. Um, we've kind of moved to, we have a Great Plains Turbo Till and we run that over in the spring or in the fall. I prefer to do it in the spring, but this year with the weather where it was, we were doing some in the fall. Um, on the left there, we bring the turbo till over. On the right, we have it. It probably doesn't do the radishes any good, but our weather, you know, it's about the end of the growing season because radishes ain't going. Um, there's a same field on the left where I turbo tilled on the right where we didn't. Nope. All right, this is a picture from this spring. It's a little dirty. Um, I'm planting beans into the rye grass from the year before. This field, I planted on the uh, 20th of April of beans. So you can see the rye isn't real big there, but there is our second best field of beans, so. Um, just picture the dirt in that field. Um, this was the last field of beans I planted. It would have been about the 8th or 9th of May. And you can see the rye grass was up and it was on the planter bar. So it was three foot deep. And um, we sprayed, this field we sprayed immediately after planting and then rolled it with just a smooth roller. We don't have a crop roller like they have. It seemed to get a pretty good kill. We really had pretty good luck just spraying um, three, 36 ounces of Roundup on everything and killing it with that. Is that a cereal rye or an annual rye? This is cereal rye. Yep. I'm scared of annual rye. They can plant it, but I can guess that's harder to kill. <laughs> and that's back to being again. So. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Andy. Uh, so now uh, we'll have oh, uh, Matt. I'm sorry, I have one more thing. Oh, sure. All right. Sorry, Matt. But, um, I was just going to tell you when one of the reasons we started doing it um, was because I'm farming now. My dad and uncle that I farm with are both 65, 70, and they're kind of cutting back a little bit. And we did as much for labor savings as anything because we've eliminated the ripper and the field cultivator out of our operation. So we don't have to have anybody running that tractor, you know, in spring, fall. I can just go out there, be with the combines, and I can be in the planting. We don't have to worry about doing any tillage work. And we kind of took the money we saved from that ripper track and put tracks on everything. So we have tracks on the combines, tracks on the drain carts, and it really paid off big this year, having that stuff. So, so I'm going to add that. <laughs> no, that's very cool. Um, so we'll have Kevin Glantz next. Um, he's, a, he's also a dealer of ours, so I can see. Um, so take it away, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like you said, I'm Kevin Glantz from Manchester, Iowa. That's down by Dubuque, Waterloo, Cedar Rapids. It's amazing uh, the, what I've heard here today from, from Dave and, and him about uh, why we're doing things and what got me into it. I started uh, eight years ago. I bought a Great Plains Turbo Tail. Uh, basically because of the labor situation. You couldn't find help. Nobody wants to drive a tractor, chisel plow, field cultivate, or do anything like that. So I did it for economic reasons. I started eight years ago. And uh, I bought a Great Plains Turbo Till. I VT'd everything in the fall so that all I had to do was plant in the spring. My first pass in the spring is either with a planter or a sprayer. I, I, I try not to do any tillage in the spring. Four years into that, Got a good feel, got comfortable with that. I started then, uh, I, I work with Albert, uh, with everybody here. You've, you've got a great group of people here at Albert Lee C. Really, give the, everybody here a, a little bit of round of applause for being so helpful. <laughs> but they really give me a lot of good information. I think they even get tired of me calling once in a while. But uh, a lot of knowledgeable people up here and very helpful. So I started just real basic, a cereal rye in the fall, and my local co-op likes this, this whole concept of, of uh, cover cropping and that, 
So I, I don't have a lot of labor. There, there's three of us. There's me, myself, and I, and half the time the other two don't show up. So <laughs> it, it's basically just me most of the time. I have my rye delivered down to the co-op, and in the fall, when we get a field done, I call them, they, they apply my P and K dry spread, and they mix my cereal rye right in with that, so they spread it. They don't charge me any extra for that. I then go out with my VT, my Great Plains Turbo Till, and about an inch and a half deep uh, to two inches on soybean stubble, we're traveling about nine and a half mile an hour. On corn stubble, we're traveling about eight mile an hour. We cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Labor, uh, it's a savings. So I did that for four years. Uh, we put down uh, on the bean stubble, we were putting down about 50 to 60 pounds of rye, hitting it with the VT, and then we come along in the spring and we spray that down and we plant right into that. So after four years of getting comfortable with that, I also on my planter, I am set up, I put down about I think this is important if you're going to plant into a cover crop and especially a rye crop because it uses so much uh, amount of nitrogen up. I, I've heard anywhere from 25 to 35 units of N. So my whole starter program on my planter is 28%. I apply about 50 to 60 units of 28% and with that I put some uh, zinc boron and sulfur as micronutrients and these are chelated so they've gone through an extra process which makes them more available to the plant. So that I have that on the farm, they bring out the 28%, I add in my, my micronutrients, that's my starter program. I do not put that by the seed, okay? I want to emphasize, you don't put 50 to 60 units uh, in the tube down uh, next to the seed. Uh, L and D has a bracket that, that, that mounts on the back by your uh, <clears throat> press wheels or uh, totally tubular also. And we just kind of pee it out the back in the tracks of the press wheel. So it's laid on right on top of the ground. The sulfur will stabilize the nitrogen that I'm putting on so we've got our, our nitrogen stabilized. But that's my starter program. Uh, what I've really noticed uh, with that process is once my, uh, here again, getting that crop up, that that's what you want to do. I really like my corn crop up within eight to 10 days. Uh, I'm not gonna go out there the 20th of April and try to no-till this into a damp, cold soil. Uh, my goal is when I plant it, I want it in the ground and I want it up. And that, that, that just correlates right along with what, what Dave was, was mentioning earlier. And that, and that uh, once you, you, once that in the no-till and, and cover crop, once that corn gets up, there's no looking back. It just takes off. So we've kind of, I'm not going to say we mastered it, but we've gotten comfortable now with that for four years. So this will be my first year now. This fall, every acre has been seeded with a cover crop, even on the corn stubble. So next year or next spring, I will be planting beans also into a cereal rye. So I kind of taken it uh, a step-by-step -step process, which I would really advise to do. Uh, try it, get, find your comfort level with things. I know the first year, man, we killed it when it was this tall. Did we, were we really excited? We had a cover crop out there about three inches tall and, and wow, we had really done something. So the next year we let it get a little bit taller, and a little bit taller. Now this year we had exceptionally good growth uh, here this spring on our, on our rye, and it was about eight to 10 inches. And that was the greenest, tallest mat of stuff. And I thought, wow. And then you see some of these pictures up here, and I'm thinking, boy, I ain't doing shit out there compared to some of these guys. <laughs> but to me, I have a comfort level, and it's, it's better if you just work your comfort level and, and, uh, and just grow with it every year. And I also then, this year, tried the, uh, the inner seeding or over seeding at about five to six collar and made the mistake, I think I kind of mentioned that, of telling my insurance company what I was doing and all hell broke loose all summer long on that deal. So uh, that's something that you'll want to check. And for some reason in this state, it's perfectly fine. There doesn't seem to be a problem with it. And I was the, uh, the, the insurance companies uh, in Des Moines seem to have a real problem with it. And uh, I was told that 
I was on the cutting edge of all this, and I said, boy, if I'm on the cutting edge, it's a pretty dull knife, because uh, <laughs> I, I really didn't care to be on the cutting edge of everything. So that, like I say, and it's all an experience. Uh, we've had our successes, we've had our failures, we've had kind of our half-ass, okay, well, it did kind of work, did not kind of work type thing. But uh, the overseeding, something we didn't realize is when you seed it, and just duh, it was one of those moments that at five collar, we seeded it. God, it's sitting there and it's on. Well, it didn't rain for two weeks. It's not when you seed it. It's when you get a little rain on it to get it to germinate. Duh, okay? It, it's not going to germinate on top of the ground, but, you know, sitting there dry. So, well, after two weeks, the corn had kept growing, and then it really grew. So I think it shaded it a little too fast. I had a little rape and a little bit of um, radish come, which was good to see. And maybe it was part of my chemical program. That was also brought up today. So maybe it was a little of the chemical program. Maybe it was a little bit of the timing. Uh, my next interceding situation will probably be a brassica. That seemed to work better than, than the mix. But uh, that's kind of what we're going to try next year. So um, I guess my main thing is uh, try something, do something, uh, live and learn is the best way. Everybody has had different experiences up here and, and I can sit there and relate to each speaker. Yeah, I've seen that. I've heard of that. I've kind of noticed that. And uh, there really is something to this, I think. I personally feel that uh, this could be the next level of our yield improvement. We've put about as much nitrogen that we can put on to, to get our yields up there. We put about as much uh, of all the nutrients on there to get our yields up. I don't think we have the soil and the biology activity in the soil to uh, break down the nutrients and make them available to the plants. That's it, I'm not a, I, I don't have a, the only degree I have is I got a master's in the school of hard knocks, okay? That's the only degree I have, but uh, other than that, it's all trial and error and, um, so I, I guess uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I've taken it in stages. Started the whole thing because of, of labor requirements and economics. And after I kind of got into it, I thought, well, boy, there's a lot better reasons to be doing some no-till. There's better reasons to be doing some cover cropping than just the economics of it. It's the soil uh, the situation. So right now, that's all I got. I guess I was just looking at my notes here, and I farm in Iowa, um, and last year I signed up for the called the CSP program. He touched on it real briefly, but if you sign up for it and the right qualifications, you got to do three improvements, but I'm getting about 20 to $25 an acre towards planting cover crops from <clears throat> government for five years, and that's basically paying the cost of the seed. I basically just have to pay the cost of the application. So it's, their money is actually there. It's got a $40,000 cap on it. That you don't have that, but um, the money is there to help pay for it and it'll pay for the cost of seed. All right, great, thank you uh, to both of you. And uh, last but not least, we've got uh, more local representation here from Tom Goddard. Thank you. Uh, I'm probably going to jump around a little bit, or actually a lot. I get that from my dad. Uh, go through a little history for when he's a storyteller. So that's why I jumped right in. Uh, about 12 years ago, or maybe even longer, my dad came back to the farm once with uh, some seed. It wasn't corn, it wasn't soybeans, it wasn't alfalfa. I thought, what the hell is this? And me and my brother helped him plant it. And I was disgusted the whole time, thinking, oh, this is stupid, it's wrong, we got the seed house. Which was good. Uh, it just wasn't what I was used to growing up. Age of five, seeing till the ground black, plant like corn, do the beans, you know, it's all the same thing. Everyone's in a rhythm. And I didn't think nothing of it. It was a failure. Not his fault. Uh, we had a guy come in, I believe he no tilled it maybe. Uh, but then I didn't think much of it because I had a totally different mindset. And then, and that, that's probably even longer than 12 years ago because about 12 years ago we tried a cereal ride. 
And we have can crops and we always have weeds after it. So, all right, we're going to try this. Or no, sorry, it was rapeseed. We put rapeseed out there. And we did it on a 20-acre strip uh, after bees. Hooked it to a little three-point spreader and then pulled the crumbler behind that. And it actually grew. Didn't think nothing of it. We did our same thing as usually we till it all up at the end of the fall. Next year, my dad called me when he was combining corn and said, what did we do here? This is the best corn I've ever seen. And I didn't think one thing about it. I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was the right one. Then about two weeks later, I realized the only thing we did different was we planted that reef seed. Maybe there is something to do with this. And this was before we could get on YouTube and look up these guys and learn. Uh, still pretty new. So then we started playing with stuff. And we played with seal rock. And we played with Well, it's easy to plant. But also you got to manage it. It's like the old way. You know, and also you got a hard time to get your field right. It's, you know, three, four feet tall. And I was not one of those guys. So now I'm out there trying to cultivate it. Well, that doesn't matter. Trying to disc it takes about three trips. Uh, so I got disgusted. But I did see a little bit of this later in the year. So then another year goes by and we try it again. We live and we learn and have success and have failures, uh, which has always kept on kind of plucking into sweet corn fields are far away. Because all our can crops are far away and like, well, we don't have to bring the combine there, they do it all, it worked out good. And then I started realizing that well, my beans are always meaty, why don't we do something with seal rather than we did the can crops? So then we decided to, alright, we're gonna Plant the seal rye and put beans in there. And next thing you know, we're also got a YouTube watch, learned a little bit, and we started trying a little no tell. And that was a couple years ago. And I did 30 acres. Whereas after she we planted it with the disc seeder that I built, uh, I grazed 15 acres and I cut 15 acres. Now, 15 acres I cut, I got 70 round bales, heavy bales. Uh, I was pretty impressed. Another 15 acres I grazed, I had my cows out in April, and also in their cabin, you know, out on grass, and out in a messy lot, getting sick. And, uh, you know, this is really nice. You know, this is what people want to see when they go to the store and buy a steak. You know, they want to know their cows are being taken care of, they're happy. So it's really starting to kind of click. All this stuff is all kind of going together. And now, to this day, I'm starting to do multiple blends of huge species after can crops, which is kind of like my small grains. You have your weed, I have my can crops. Uh, and it works really good for us. And now I'm coming up with 15 weight blends and calorie load. I got a big till grass back there, which size it doesn't matter, but the species delta does. And I kind of learned that through the years of. Uh, grew up with a tile plot. My dad always liked doing drainage, and so I spent a lot of time four feet deep in the ground. And I was digging the ground and snow was dead dirt, steel, no worms. And all of a sudden I did some tile in the cover crop field that I did. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, this smells nice. Good aroma. There's some worms. There's some roots. And it just, there's such a drastic change from dead stale soil to living cover crop, living dirt, uh, it's unbelievable. But I live right on the side of Austin, uh, so I get a lot of people right from town to see our farm. And it's kind of neat for them to in the wintertime look out and see all these black fields with a little bit of snow, dirty snow, and also they see mine, it's all green, it's all beautiful white snow, because it actually, it actually stays there. My dirt doesn't blow. Uh, pretty happy about that. Uh, one thing I did do that really changed the way I farm was I got on a soil health team over here in Fremont County. And I went from feeling like I was the only one out here doing it besides in the distance on YouTube down in you know, Ohio or wherever. It's awesome. Well, there's a couple guys right over here, a couple guys there. So I suggest anyone that if you're going to do it, build a network. You know, find all farmers that you know, that you can trust, you can talk to, you can bounce ideas off. 
Uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, I see, you know, I'm looking at their sales and I want to be like yours. And they're looking at why you sold my stuff and saying they want to be like mine. But we're all on the right path. And uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So I guess uh, that's a little bit about me, or a lot. But there you go. I like it. I, I 
in a foot program for three years, so after these three years, I'm hoping to be just strictly no-till or maybe a, like a vertical till or strip till uh, to get me through. I, I don't know if I can spend money on a big rig like that, but I think I can make a strip till more. I, I like to make things and play around with stuff, so who knows, we'll see. And also, as far as trash rivers in my ride, I, I plan to do it. I, I like to get up to, uh, you know, preferably about three feet. And my, I have trash rivers on there. Sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. Uh, usually the ground's good enough from the cover crop that I really don't worry about it. I do have crow stitch closing wheels. There you go. Uh, I love them. Uh, they work really good for me, so. I'm having, but there, there's so many options out there. I don't think there's a wrong or right way. Right? It's just what's going to work underground. Um, I did a little experiment last year on the Delta Force on the planter, and I'm putting it on my planter for this year, and I'm able to come over and have it. And the rows where we call them in our 10,000 gallon winter tank, and where that tank would pull into the field and start out, those rows I saw it's a little bit of an emergency issue. And where we did the Delta Force planter, it didn't happen. Worked a little better, and you can see on the screen it's putting a lot more down pressure in those rows. So I'm adding Delta Force for this year. Yeah. My question is maybe for Dave to answer, but does after 5, 10, 15, 20 years of uh, cover crop and, and a diverse cropping system, does your biology of the soil um, keep your soil warmer or warm your soil up? Yes, because we have, we have a lot more microactivity, we have more livestock underneath the soil, so the soil is probably three to five degrees warmer than the neighbor's conventional soil. You know, and then in the summertime, it's about seven to 12 degrees cooler uh, during the growing season. I'll answer that one too. Does this one work? I think so. John, is that, is that one good? Yeah, oh, uh, Actually, I had the local agronomy scientist from the NRCS putting out uh, temperature gauges this year. And I actually just got the data back here last week. And like they were saying, three to five degrees warmer consistently from April 1st up to May 15th when they took them all. And it just it rides up above the conventional curve, which is on the Sarah Grant. So we were comparing, you know, 50 feet apart, and the only time they come together is when I get a rain. We can see every day of the rain, cold rain, they come together, and within a day, the cover crop would start bouncing off faster. At nighttime, it was, it was warmer, and I got that, and I'm thinking, oh, great, I can finally show my neighbors. And then I got thinking, they're still not coming to me. You know? You're, you're up against the wall a lot of times trying to tell people, you know, Saw a neighbor yesterday, he plowed his field, now he's disking it, disking it too. You know, every time I drive down my road, I look his way and I see dust blowing across his road. It just it blows my mind. I even got the data, I can show you, but you're still not going to leave. So just keep working at it, I guess. Do you have another question? Yeah. Have you tried move your maturity of your soybeans earlier so you can get a cover crop planted in the fall and can you justify the difference in yield? You know, I, I, I've got people that say, well, why would you not plant a group two soybeans because they'll yield 65 bushels and if I wanted to go to like a point eight so I could get a cover crop planted, you know, middle of September and gain gain all that in the yeah. wall. Have you seen some of them, like the 1.5 beans out there? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, what, what, are you able to put a number, put a dollar value on how much more you can get out of your cover crop than you would have gotten out of your normal My 1.5 one five, one five no ride beans last year were my best. This year they weren't my best, they are my second best. And my third best. And you know, also, but then you're also able to get the cover crop planted. So yeah, so yeah. Can, can you can you put a dollar value on that cover crop? Mm -hmm. what I'm to get well, the what I put on is I got to put more species in. Okay. You know, for me being a quick program, if it was going to be after October first, it was going to be winter, I winter trip. Well, you know what? That's what I do all the rest of the year. 
getting in early, I could put in some grass in there. And that was a neat thing. So, can I put money on it? No, but diversity? Yes. Um, I guess we're just a little part of the south. I plant ginger like 19920 and then some 23s. But we found with our two O's, we got a pretty good number on it. But I'll, sometimes I'll plant that before I'll even plant any corn. And we're about 30 miles from Iowa Falls Cargill plant. And they'll have a zero basis, say, until people start combining beans. And then we can hit that early market with the earlier bean, and then we can get the cover crop going even better. So we can actually make more off of that earlier bean because Cargill wants them. And it's been that way the last three years. We'll get a 30 cent bump in the market in first week of stem. And I have uh, kind of moved my maturity up a little bit. I have been planting the two fives to two eights. In our area, a two to a three is kind of real common. And I back them up to about a one nine, two, two one type situation. So just back them. But as far as the yield situation, um, I can't, these bean uh, varieties have really, even the shorter day ones, have really gotten good. And I, I don't think you're losing out on really any yield. Uh, when, when you're uh, shortening them up a little bit like that. It, it didn't make a major change, uh, but it does help. As soon as we get the beans up, and that, then it's, it's, it just uh, go as hard as you can. You get the fertilizer on, you get it get the work in. And uh, kind of being a dad, uh, my 22-year-old my daughter has always had a little interest in farming, and, and uh, so this was her first year, and it, it sure ain't the way I started out. <laughs> I started out on a 20 horse tractor and two row cultivator. Uh, she's 22, and I, this fall I stuck her in a 180 horse tractor and mules and front wheel assist and 22 feet, nine and a half mile an hour. And I said, Don't you dare hit a fence. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't text the drive. That's right. I said, The phone goes off while you're running this. And, and so every night she'd come out after work, run two to three hours she didn't like running after dark which was fine but uh, yeah it uh, gave her a little taste of, of what this is all about and, and so it was, it was kind of neat but uh, she really helped me out uh, for about a week or ten days two or three hours a night really kept things going we keep that VT machine on the roll so while we're doing corn and beans and everything else so but, uh, but yeah it, it does help a little bit to, to answer your question yeah we're, we're backing the bean maturity up just a little bit so that we can just get out there just a day or two or three sooner, uh, it does help. Can you talk about your men's herbicide program? Can you repeat the question? Uh, that's about bean herbicide programs. Uh, actually, uh, I was a non-GMO grower for a long time, and um, I found out that weeds will become resistant to Cobra just like they'll become resistant to Roundup. And I kind of, uh, man, I, I don't think much of Mother Monsanto, so I skipped them completely. I, this is my, one of my second or third year of the Liberty Bean program, and putting down a residual uh, authority first, and then we come back with the Roundup, or not the Roundup, the Liberty, uh, and then the Warrant, the Warrant product. So I'm actually putting two residuals down, but I've, uh, I'm very, very satisfied with uh, the Liberty uh, Wheat Control Program. All right, I do some non-GMO and some Roundup beans. Um, next year, I'm probably going to eat because Liberty beans are a problem field. But um, we do, like on this field, you can see the spring back. We're spraying uh, 36 ounces of Roundup some, and then Matador as the pre. And it's got a three-way action. Three of the most action that's worked pretty well for us. Um, feels real tough, right? We problems. That's why I'm trying to the leadings try that. Really, we haven't had a lot of issues, and I then I come back with flex on first rate and a generic few slide. Uh, I guess I'm a little different. I when I do my soybeans, I uh, you know I'm, I'm shooting for a taller rye, and I'll go in. I, I don't use a pre at all. I go on with a, a light rate, like 20 ounces of Roundup, and I also add in about one pint of Flex RGT, which gives me a little more Roundup, and it gives me, well, I think it's four ounces of Flex Star, uh, just that light, a little more burn in case there's something else in there. So that's my burn down. My rye actually acts as my pre, and then I turn around and come back, and my pull is to I boost up the, 
I keep the round up the same and I'll boost up the Flexstar G2 GT to about 1.5 pints. So at the end of the year, I'm still at 2.5 pints of Flexstar GT, which is 3.5 pints, uh, which you could have a problem with planting a cover crop later in the year. But since I'm spread it out and I'm at a reduced rate, uh, I've been really lucky as far as weed control and what I want to do for cover crops in the fall. Uh, on a corn, uh, we'll probably go in with uh, a half a pint, 2,4-D at corn planting time. And, and then we roll up the crop backwards, so that's our herbicide program on that. And if uh, we'll plant into uh, six and seven foot tall rye for soybeans, and we just roll up and we'll use a herbicide program there. And that seems to be working for us. That's impressive. Yeah, in the back. Uh, you don't have liquid manure to, to inject or incorporate. What do you do with, uh, with other livestock manure that's got bedding and so forth? Does that just continue to, to accumulate? Uh, does it add to the mulch? What do you, what do, you do with that? I, I think if you can, the best, you know, you need to spread it as evenly, evenly as you possibly can. And keep the red applicated rates down. Uh, you know, we've spread some turkey litter, uh, had it done custom uh, because the houses are about 200 miles away from us, but they're looking somewhere to get rid of the manure. And uh, I've been real impressed with the, with the spreading jobs. It's about two tons of acres what we're putting on. And it does, it does a nice job and helps build the organic matter more rapidly. I'm not lucky enough to have any manure available. All right, um, some of our fields far away from our hog sites, we put chicken litter on, and I've had pretty good luck just spreading it on the top, and I've had real, I had real good luck running the vertical tunnel over it after we spread it. Um, and then in the fields where we'll spread the chicken litter on, say it's bean stubble, we'll spread chicken litter on it, a lot of times I won't work it at all, and then I'll pull an hydrus in spring on it, and then just plant it. I don't work it again after pulling hydrus on it, wait a week, and then you plant it. And I've had real good luck doing that too. Uh, I do have beef cow, uh, so cow calf. So we do have a lot of litter manure, and I have one good spreader that does an excellent job of putting a nice thin layer on. Uh, and I always tell the driver as fast as you can go. Uh, but then we also have another one that does throw up mumps, and if I end up not liking it, I will go out in the spring and do a light tillage on it to bust it up a little bit, but also if I'm going to do a good cereal rye or something like that, and that good soil activity, biological activity, is not near as bad as you think. So, and then also, we went through some this year uh, with the strip till, uh, and that, that ended up being, doing pretty good too, so. I had a question. Dave, you said when you were uh, planting the five, six foot rye, um, and then you go in and roll it. Uh, is that in the Andesa stage, or do you have any trouble with it coming back up at all for a rollback? Uh, to roll it and have it stay down, it's got to be uh, in boot stage or taller. And closer to pollination, it's even better. Uh, as you're rolling that rye, you can, it sounds like you're popping popcorn. You know, you can hear that. If you can hear that sound, it'll never come back up. You know. Uh, closer to that bloom, it, it really rolls nice. Uh, this is for Dave. Uh, when you interseeded soybeans into your corn, uh, as in your test plots, did you do that one trip, or did you stagger it, and did you use the same planter? And the other question is, I live two hours north of here, uh, I've been told that uh, annual ryegrass will not survive the winter in my area. I'm just wondering if that's true or not. Uh, the first question I can answer really good. Uh, we have a splitter planter, so we plant the beans and the corn at the same time. You know, you could you could double back. I wouldn't see why you couldn't if you just had a 30 inch planter and wanted to do soybeans with it because the beans laid in it. What rate did you plant the beans? 
Uh, we ended up at 20 pound the acre because we changed. We used a 60 cell plate rather than 120, so that cut our seed rates in half. You know, still didn't have to mess with the drive shafts on the plant or anything. You know, uh, the right grass. I can't answer that question. So yeah, I mean, the rye grass. I mean, this is just kind of a, a general recommendation. But even in southern Minnesota, it's not reliably going to winter down here. Now that being said, um, last year we had a lot of people call us with uh, rye grass overwintering, as well as stuff that normally would even be less winter hardy than, than rye grass, like dwarf Essex rape and uh, turnips and radish, all overwinter. Um, so as the, you know, as the climate continues to change, you know, we might get into a situation where the dry grass is getting more reliable in winter uh, in this environment. But as you go further north, I think it's still a fairly safe bet to say that it's going to die out in the winter. What about the uh, The question was about BNS ryegrass. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's important to note too that um, there is some variants of annual ryegrass that are resistant to Roundup. Um, and they've had more issues with that as you get down into Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, where they use annual ryegrass more frequently than we do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think from a cost perspective, it, it still makes sense to, to probably look at BNS annual ryegrass, mainly because of where our environment is. Um, but yeah, as you get further south into Iowa, um, it may be worthwhile to look into an actual variety of ryegrass that you know is going to die in the spring. Uh, I've had annual ryegrass for a couple of years, and you know I think it's going to pin on the winter every time. If you have good snow cover, you know with no winds that can get down to it, it's probably going to the winter. If you don't have much snow cover and extreme cold, it probably won't. Also, the wind. You know, it's kind of like in the in the Cali right? I can have my water freeze at 20 degrees if it has the right wind. You know, it's kind of same thing with plants too. I think if there's that right wind with the right moisture in there, it'll probably freeze. But if you have good cover over it, good chance it'll come back. You know, I'll always be prepared. You know, either way, if you're going to plant in your eye grass, have a plan going into the spring that I am going to kill it if it does come back. Yeah, you want to, if we're going to add any legumes, I'm, I'm just planting uh, sugar, sugar rye for right now, and uh, it just, I, my main goal is to keep it economical. Now, to me, flying on a cover crop is out of the question, but I think it's too expensive to apply. That's why I went with the inner seed. If I can do something with the, with the high boy Haiti when I top dress my urea, that's the time that as long as they're making a pass and they're, the, the co-op is really accommodating, if I want to add something, uh, I am, I'm thinking about the radish and the, and the brassica. Um, we had a clover. That didn't really come, but maybe that was because of the chemical. I don't know. But yeah, I'm always looking to add something, but it's got to be economical. And I can get all the use I need out of my rye by planting it in October. Um, I can't get that out of the grass because it doesn't have enough time. So uh, I look at the economics and, and what do I need to do at what time? And, and that, make, that drives my decision on what to do. But yeah, I, I'm always thinking about what can I add next? What can I do next to, to improve the situation and, and add a, a mix to it and, and see it, it's just a lot of trial and error. I agree with you completely. Um, I've tried a number of different things, um, but I just had a hard time getting stuff like clover or some of the other stuff to really take off at all. And for what it costs to do it, I'm adding $5 an acre to my cost of cover crop seed, and then you go out there and you see one plant, one plant, one plant, and I don't know, it's just with aerial seeding, it's not getting enough ground contact or the way I do it, you know, but I just haven't seen enough benefit to justify the expense. Um, I tried 
200 acres of, I, I've got my own extra uh, clover with me in this unit. I, I probably won't do it again, I just don't see it. But, um, I'm probably going to cut my radishes down a little bit in the future. I just kind of went with the original NRCS recommendation and I've been thinking I can get by with a little bit less and save a little bit of money. You know, they're about a dollar and twenty pounds, so save a little bit on them. So you had you had the door, have you thought about it at all trying to go to a slurry? I um, just my labor situation doesn't really allow it. We we, we don't get the manure hauled until I and mean, we just finished Monday hauling manure and just the timing of it all. We started a month and a half ago and we just got done Monday, so ideally I think we're good, but it, it just the labor and coordination is just an issue for, for me. So. Uh, the question about the legumes, I just want to see if Dave or Tom had a, had a opinion on that, if, if you had any suggestions about how to make that more successful. Well, I think the, the legume part of it has to be where you can win after a small grain. So you have that time to, so it can can't be and do the things it needs to do. Uh, you know, uh, any kind of legume, I, I tell my producers if we use any kind of legume, we can knock 50 pound nitrogen out of their, their mix for the corn. Uh, the biggest problem is, is make sure they understand they need to go to corn because you sure don't want to, uh, 50 or 100 pounds of nitrogen in the soil for soybeans because then they get lazy like I am. They get fat and they won't produce. You know, uh, you need to keep a soybean starved. Uh, that's why I like rye. Rye ties up all the nitrogen in the soil. So when the bean first starts putting it out, growing, it, it puts more nodules on the plant or on the roots. So that means the nodes will be closer. If you watch your no-till beans and rye, the nodes will be closer. Instead of two pods or two trifolas, you'll probably end up with three to five, and they're touching each other, and that's where the yield comes from. So keep the clovers out if you're going to use uh, rye or uh, soybeans. Uh, I, I did intercede some red clover into. Uh, V6, and it, it was kind of hit and miss. Uh, I know I was kind of right on the edge of chemical problems. Uh, I probably will throw a little bit more in again, but after like a canning crop with a big blend, I, I threw in, I had 17 species, but I just threw in all my clovers, trying to see which one's going to work best for me. I'm like, red clover by far is the best one for me in this situation. Uh, but I also did like my vetch. My vetch really grew very good in there. And I got many brassicas, and the cows eat the brassicas, and also there's the vetch. You know, there's the clover. There's kind of just a one step, two step, three steps. I got a friend back there, Tom Finnegan. He had the same thing. He cut off the tops of his uh, cover crop, bailed it, sold that, and now all his smaller stuff is coming. So now he's got his red clovers in there. And his, I think his red clover is <laughs> probably about three times the size of my thumb. Uh, pretty impressive. So it, it can be done, but you know, you gotta have a small grain, cane crop, something in there. Uh, if I was gonna interseed, it's probably more of a brass because they're probably doing better. So another question, maybe this is touched on a little already, but people, some of my customers, they're having a lot of trouble with uh, grubs and army worms, um, like no-tilling, they're going in their no-tilling corn into rye or any cover crop for that matter, and cover crop dies, and then there's just the corn there, and army worms just shoot it right down to nothing. They've been going over two, three straight passes, and they're getting sick of it. Are they putting a little insecticide in, like a pounce, um, uh, just a real, what? Yeah, there's several. I've always, when, when they when they burn it down, uh, they do the, uh, the corn stalks, and you know, they do the bean stubble to, you know, when I first got going with all this, but I've always put down a, a product like pounce, 
And I'm trying to think, of, I, I've used a different product about three years in a row, but no, I've never had any problem with army worms. It's got about a two week residual. And so that's my goal is that I want about getting my corn up in eight to 10 days because they spray it and two days later I'm planting. And so then that means that corn is coming up while that residual is still there for the last 10 days to two weeks. And then after your corn gets up and, and gets some strength, it gets a little size to it, then it really don't bother. But I can honestly say I've never had an any type of a worm problem uh, since I started the no-tilling because I've always been, uh, I, would, I don't want to call it a weak insecticide, but it wasn't counter or morris man or something like that, you know, because I didn't want to hurt my worms. You know, stuff. And, I, and I find early in the spring, the worm activity isn't that, isn't real active on the top of the ground with that little bit of insecticide has really ever hurt my worm population. So um, th that's what I've always done, is I always had just a real uh, top dress uh, type of, uh, um, of insecticide. Now you're putting that insecticide where? In with the spray? Yeah, in with the spray. yeah I'm broadcasting it. Uh, that goes in with the, uh, Will it be the Roundup, and then, um, and then, well, this year, for last year, a couple of we've used Lumax or, or your harness extra or whatever, but, uh, yeah, um, I've always put some type of a low-grade insecticide just to, to take care of the initial two weeks of, of bugs, I guess. So, and, and not finding that it has really bothered anything else so far. Anybody else want to talk on that? I guess I have. I never really had an issue with that. We do a full rotation, corn meat rotation now. Every it's rotated all the time. I've never, never corn or corn, but we never. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Lambicide, it, it pounds. Lambicide, a little bit too. I can think of right now that I've used in the past. So uh, I haven't had a problem. I I did strip, I did strip till this year, uh, and. I did strip till and I let my rye grow right next to it. Uh, it wasn't huge, but there was something there. You know, these bugs just want something to chew on, these insects. They want something to chew on. And a perfect example of that is I, I live on the edge of town. I had a two acre sweet corn plot. I was driving to town trying to sell with the biggest headache. I was trying to line up a truck, so I'm sit there, sell. It was terrible. So I started inviting people all to come and just come pick your own for two bucks a dozen. It was by far the best deal there was, except then when you get people showing up and they're not supposed to be there. But what I'm going to say about it is, I had spots in that sweet corn where there was some grass growing and I didn't spray it to them. And when I went to pick sweet corn, guess where I didn't have any worms in the corn, in the ears of corn, where that grass was growing. You know? and, I, and I noticed that 15 years ago when corn war started. We had a or a woolly cup problem. Wherever the woolly cup was, I didn't have any corn board my uh, corn. Where I was clean, that's where I had a problem. You know, it's it's a thing of balancing. You just gotta balance and love that chew on something besides your corn. Board. I think uh, if you can add a few brassicas in your your rye mix, will help a lot on. Uh, Get rid of worms because as that brassica dies from the herbicide or dies from the weather, it gives off a sulfur odor. You know, most brassicas give off sulfur. Uh, if you can get, I know, if you can get some and keep those away. When we introduce more brassicas in a rye, we stop having only one problem. Got maybe time for a couple more. Yep. This isn't a question that there's a lot of talk about growing cover crops on just more grain, which I would agree with that. <coughs> I'm from Nebraska, and one of the things we had going on is guys, some of them had a switch going and maybe some of their soybeans to a, a two grade E, but you harvest that in July, and then you put a, uh, we got guys putting in a 12 or 14 species cover crop. And where that really becomes really neat is that they have livestock and they can grade that. And what we're trying to do after the first grade is then go in and broadcast in some more rye and some other things that will over winter. And in the first
first mix they put in would have been uh, a lot of grazing <coughs> species and some of them maybe wouldn't pull them in. So they're, they're getting a lot of bank with the buddy in this whole cup of crop mix. But that only works if you have more up to the feet. Just like, just like anything else we talked about today. Other questions? Well, let's give all the panelists a uh, big